subject is actually not the building itself, not the artifacts themselves, <coughs> but the response uh, in our world that is uh, going to be related to us tonight is actually the response of scholars like Ulrich and the dedication over many years to the pursuit of truth and accuracy, to the idea that precision is not just an affectation but also a way of life. And it's with that that I uh, welcome my colleague, Ulrich Lehmann. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that very generous and very kind welcome. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you about a project which occupies myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Ebeling, from the German Forum of History of Art in Paris since about 15 years. We were very happy when we finally found the means to publish <coughs> the book. And uh, the result uh, is outside on the table. They had some print issues. So the um, book, which arrived already in the United States, will be released on the national market on the 22nd of November. But there is a copy outside uh, on the table. And I use uh, many images from that book, which was published by Camayo in this fall. Now, the Hotel Beauharnais and the residence uh, today of the German ambas ambassador has a very complex history in as far as it is a building which dates, as so many of those wonderful mansions, from the 18th century. It was built on the left bank, the so-called Faubourg Saint-Germain, uh, next today to the Musée d'Orsay, which you all uh, probably know from your visits in Paris and seeing wonderful impressionist paintings. But this building is somehow strange and special. It uh, survived as a private building uh, after the revolution, being after having served as a ballroom, public ballroom, it was bought by Eugène de Beauharnais, who was able to sell it as his personal asset to the King of Prussia. After the downfall, 
of Napoleon and it has since um, been in the curatorship first of the Prussian Kingdom, then of the German Empire, then of the Weimar Republic, then of the um, dark years of the Third Reich and it was taken away from Germany um, in 1945 after the capitulation and restituted um, in due course of the contract of friendship between <coughs> France and the Federal Republic of Germany in 1962. So that is a really continuous story and there is this mixing of French and German culture in this place which uh, makes this building a highly important building in the French-German uh, dialogue. I show you here one of the view from the early 19th century which is, um, has appeared from the uh, long lost uh, for us non-accessible archives in the chateaus of Potsdam. Um, this project we are working on right now wouldn't have been possible without German reunification um, and as well as for the archives as for uh, accessory documents which we found um, it's absolutely amazing how far the reunification made this project possible. And this is also important to know why people in previous periods couldn't do what we were able to do uh, thanks to this uh, political fact some 25 years ago. Now the building was built as a real real estate operation in the kind of style we see in New York City and so far as this German Vaufran, a fabulous architect who was very successful and financially very affluent at some point, said okay I'm developing the left bank and uh, he just built three Hotel Particulier, three big mansions in a very similar style um, the Hotel Barbouarnais, about which we talk tonight, is the kind of only one which has kind of survived with its interiors. There's another building which was pulled down, um, which is located there where the Kugel Gallery is today, uh, with a new building from the 19th century. And the next building um, next to it has been completely gutted in as a French ministry. So luckily, the Hotel Barbouarnais has kept many of its historic interiors. I show you two unknown views which were found by Alexandre Gadi in L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts in the um, uh, due course of our research and uh, the garden plan on the right hand side uh, was found in the paperwork which was raised in, in due course of the selling of the building from Eugène de Bonnet to the King of Prussia in 1817. The building is um, very non-spectacular for the facade if there wouldn't be the portico uh, in the Egyptian style which was added by the son of Napoleon, Eugène de Beauharnais, who bought the building in 1803 when he was a 21-year-old lad only, but he had already fought and accompanied Napoleon in 1798 to the so-called Compagnie d'Egypte, which was a military absolute uh, faillite, but um, it was managed and addressed um, for, by the French as a great success. Uh, and it had a big success in the arts and also for the sciences. And so uh, France changed this view of a military um, echec into something which really had an impact. And as Eugène was a part of this campaign, he quoted Egypt uh, many times, as you will see um, in due course. The garden side of the palais has just remained still very much the same as in the 18th century. If there wouldn't be the uh, third floor which had been added only in the 19th century when the uh, building became too small for the uh, embassy of Prussia which uh, had already at that time located the representation and the office in the one building. Today this building is used only as the official residence of the ambassador to France in Paris but at the time uh, the building was really like overused and so they needed to add a floor which was done very carefully by respecting the wonderful gable with a uh, divinity of a river god. The building was very handsomely located on the river bank of the Seine and I show you here a view which came up at Tefaf in Maastricht this year. It's a fragment of a um, panorama which was shown in Vienna in 1815 and we found that the Hotel Particulier is really from Eugène de Bonnet is visible here very well with its garden and what is interesting is that we know that the panorama was painted from top of the roof of the pavilion floor as the Tuileries which are just opposite and that is where the then uh, 1803 the consul Bonaparte, he was not yet em emperor and his wife Josephine would have had their residence when they would be in Paris. 
Now, Eugène Bohane bought the building in 1803, but he actually lived there very, very short time because when he moved in, the house had to be renovated. He might have moved in in the fall of 1803 on the first floor, but actually the second floor was only finished much later. And he uh, had been sent by Napoleon to Italy to be vice king of, uh, of Italy, resi residing in Milan in the uh, summer of uh, 1804 and so he came back only in 1805 being called to Munich to meet his future wife whose portrait he until then had only seen on a little coffee cup which Napoleon had sent to him. So luckily that match went very well. You see the young couple here on the right hand side. This is a scene which is happening in the green gallery of the QVE wing of the residence in Munich, um, reconstructed after the war, very much looking like this again today. And you see the um, royal family of Bavaria and Napoleon and Josephine under the uh, helmet. I show this picture, which is not related to the Hotel Boane, but it is because it was in Munich on the occasion of the um, uh, the wedding in the beginning of 1805, that Napoleon was actually speaking to Josephine uh, about the high cost of the renovations of the Hotel Boanet. <coughs> the, uh, Joseph, um, the young Boanet at that time was a kind of splashy young man who really wanted to show off his new position and uh, his mother, uh, uh, of all, uh, wanted to really also please his, her son and to do the, the right thing to present him really in, uh, in his new status. And that was really done um, in a way which did not please to Napoleon, who still was kind of following the Republican ideal of a certain simplicity which would uh, correspond to the then still up um, to date Republican model. Now, uh, the building which we're seeing today still displays wonderful remains of the splendor of that um, imperial outlook or of this kind of status which was intended for um, Eugène de Boarnay by his mother and by Eugène himself. We think that when he had leave to, to Italy, he gave the commissions and the survey of that building and of the work there to his mother, Josephine, who was known to be a very nice money spender and she loved decoration and she was a trendsetter in good materials. We know about her wardrobe, we know about her shopping in silver and in, in China. And she really took her pleasure in doing this house. The incredible thing is that the interiors of the Hotel Boanet are very important today because aussi bien le Palais des Tuileries que le Château de Saint-Cloud n'existe plus, they don't exist anymore, they were both um, burnt and destroyed at the end of the 19th century. So there are interiors in the Hotel Boanet which are actually very interesting not only for the representation of the German ambassador, uh, but also for the uh, knowledge of uh, French decorative arts and interior decoration in the very short span between 1800, 1803 to 1805. And in this context, the interiors are also very interesting to um, the work which architects like Charles Bessier or Fontaine would do in Paris at the same time. When we started to work on the building, it had been restored, and this is a photograph from the time when the building was restituted to the Federal Republic of Western Germany in 1962. It needed some work done, to say it very gently. Um, the work was executed on the best knowledge by a team of French architects and uh, German administrators, and they really did the best they could could do to the knowledge of the time. But you will see in due course how our vision has changed since. So we have this very illuminated and very hom homogeneous coloring of the very pastel colored um, textiles. We have this incredible impeccable look, which looks just like all official photographs of residences of the 1960s. <laughs> and this for an art historian who has, um, has to, had the chance to be brought up in the 1970s and with the inquisitive spirit of the 80s to not look just right. And that is exactly <laughs> what um, our director at the German Forum, Thomas Gatkins, and uh, the then ambassador, Friedrich von Nordenskjöld, decided when they were together in the Hotel Particulier and Friedrich von Nordenskjöld had just arrived. And so it was actually our director, Thomas Gatkins, who said we need to do something with our um, residence here for the ambassador. We want to do a project and I will give you art historians who will work on the 
um, documents and on the project to restitute this building in a more valid and a much more uh, dignified way. So here is a picture where you see what we found when we came and this is the kind of aim where what we are looking for when we, when we leave. It's not always um, very easy to find the budgets and to realize those uh, projects but we trying our best and again here you see the, really the difference of wonderful parsimentary work uh, but very sad colors which were apparently favored as we found in documents in the 1960s because these garish colors which we like today would have been too much for the young um, Federal Republic of Germany. And here you see the uh, very bright colors which we favor and which we uh, always try to um, confirm with documents uh, in the archives of the Mobilier National in France or with realizations in the French national castles. I have to say that this project would not have been possible without the intense support we get from our French colleagues. So we have an academic committee which decides on the uh, research which my colleague and I work out from the documents. We present files and projects. They have to be approved by the academic committee which is uh, um, composé, which is composed with curators or former curators of the national museums and curators also who currently work in the national institutions of France and so we try to have the most possible loyalty to the projects we do. Now in due course of restoring the building we also try to be uh, very preventive and there comes in my experience from uh, preserving heritage from the National Trust in the UK in so far as that we try to think the best conservation is preventive conservation in, in the way of trying to, to preserve what isn't damaged um, is always better and kind of think what could happen. So in this way we try to bring in uh, um, window screens which is UV filter on the on the, on the windows themselves and we try to reintroduce things like glass domes for the gilded clocks which had been very dirty when we started to work. We have them slowly cleaned and then try to find the money to buy these glass domes again. Um, we also put those filters here on the windows and you see that it can be seen when you look but it's kind of um, a very discreet way of protecting the textiles inside the building and making them uh, live a longer period of time. Now, the, what we try to aim to do in our work is to reconstitute the rooms after an inventory which was found with the deeds which go with the sale of the building in 1817 from Eugène de Bonnet to the King of Prussia, who used the house as his pied à terre. On the first, um, on the first, um, uh, how do you call this, like invasion of Paris by the Allies in 1814. Um, the Prussian king chose already the Hotel Bouhane for living there with his army and he found himself very comfortable and after the fall of uh, Napoleon in Waterloo 1815 when the Allies returned, he returned to that building and he found it so attractive that he, 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 he resided again there. So it was in a kind of a, in, in a logic uh, succession that in 1817 when this house came onto the market um, after having been looked at by um, um, uh, the Bank House of Bearings and other people to eventually acquire it or rent it, um, he really bought it. Now, interesting thing is that the inventory which was made on the purpose of the sale is there, we have it, and we could analyze it and compare with the things which are conserved in the house and which are no longer there. The library is a prominent room when you enter the building and it was restituted in, in, uh, in 2010. And we're coming back to this at some point. We knew that the walls were painted, a very easy, quick to realize and somehow cheap way of refiguring a room um, which was very fashionable in the 1790s and lived on until the mid of the, the teens of the uh, in early 19th century. And the fabulous thing is that you see those incredible uh, bookcases which are preserved and they are in fact the bookcases which belong to Eugène de Boinet, which he at the moment of the sale requested to be sent to him to Munich. Uh, by his man in charge in Paris because he no longer had the right to come back to Paris and luckily the intendant resisted to send them and so we still have them here today. Um, the green salon on the ground floor is very interesting. It's the first room we did when we started in 2003 and we had a terrible rush because um, Ambassador Norden's court would wanted to have this room 
<coughs> ready for his leaving party. And he had all the documents, he had evidence of what needed to be done. And what was very helpful is that the budgets were existing. So we could start full blast in getting the project uh, on the run. The decisions which had to be taken were basically on the form of the balances which were described in the inventory of being of two colors and then working on the exact model of those very complex um, passmon trees and, uh, and woven borders which were done on a hand loom in silk velvet in Lyon. So this is detail work which took a long time and which I come back to in a moment when we look at um, detail of the furniture. Now the last salon we just finished uh, some weeks before I came here um, to lecture in New York is the uh, uh, Salon of the Four Seasons, which is so huge and the budget was so and so complex that we had to work for this room over a period of five years, starting in 2011 with the walls to be um, changed in the coloring and then working on the furniture and last and least now um, getting it uh, upholstered in a fabric which resembles to the original uh, pattern which might have been there in the time of Napoleon. The cherry red room um, was done in 2010 and this is a room which is very interesting because it was entirely financed by um, uh, sponsors money uh, of the club of the, of the circle of friends of the Hotel Boarnet which very generally supports our project. Now what is interesting in due um, course of our research uh, which I could lead uh, very efficiently from New York and with the resources in the United States in my time when I was here at the BGC and working also um, in preparation of, of the past year exhibition which will open in some days here uh, is that I discovered an enormous amount of documents from that period and from the workshop of Tassier in uh, American collections and one of the most precious um, documents is this book with drawings which is actually kept the drawings and prints in the Metropolitan Museum and which uh, now as um, uh, as was uh, just discovered by Jean-Philippe Garrick, the curator of the Percier exhibition, uh, can be really attributed to the workshop because they have the handwriting of Percier, which was identified on some of, on some of those etchings, which, you, which you, I show you one page of here. Um, there are other documents which were recently discovered by colleagues in French archives, um, and it's very interesting to see how much of these um, drawings appeared actually uh, during my visits with the students at the sales rooms in the New York sales room. So we were very happy and, and very rich in having a wonderful um, supporting documents for our project in the, in the publication and in the research. Uh, the, the, the image I want to give you is here, the, for example, what we did in the Four Seasons room. This is the room before restoration with those kind of uh, cream colored covers on the chairs and then this cream colored cover we couldn't get rid of yet but uh, we hope that perhaps one day we find money to do something else and then you just <laughs> see those colors here and then when I show you well, this is another picture with these lighting fixtures and this is the salon as it looks today we took scrapings on the wall we found eight coats of overpaint and we realized that this kind of pastel color which we saw on the surface was actually dating from 1904 when uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, the ill-fated Kaiser of Germany, had uh, paid uh, a restoration for the centenary of the Napoleonic crowning in 1904 and they had done an enormous effort to restore the uh, building to their best knowledge at the time but of course interpreting empire style as they um, would see it in the, in the time. What we do try now is that we get uh, really conservators who help us to analyze what we have and then try to restitute um, with the support of Le Mou Mou uh, Monument Historique uh, and the architects which these different decisions done in the right. you see today is the result of a year as a very educated uh, and a lover of the art. There are very nice, nice similarities with uh, the imperial or with the castles from the consulate and the imperial period and we were very fortunate to find this engraving of the dining room in the Chateau de Saint-Cloud which no longer exists 
which obviously displayed the same kind of monumental figures as we see here with the dancer in the music room in the Hotel Douarnet. And that was really a very interesting research. Again, the fact to work here at VGC with the students and to do a lot of inquisitive uh, final papers at the end of the year brought up an enormous amount of source material which actually uh, we could uh, use in the research for the Hotel Boarnet, so it all fitted very well together. So this is the, uh, the music room which has canvas paintings probably done by two different hands and the paintings are separated by pillars which depict um, kind of birds sitting in flowers and on vases in the style of the um, of the uh, lodges uh, by Raphael in the Vatican. The house gives incredible views. Uh, it's still very much preserved in the main parts of its representative rooms. Uh, there were lots of places which had suffered due to the position of the building on the riverbanks of the Seine. So when it had been given back to the Federal Republic in 1962, it had been to be put in a concrete socle because it was moving and had uh, incredible cracks in the walls. So this is now uh, all done and it is stable, but needs a lot of uh, s service and, and uh, surveillance. Uh, in the music room, what is interesting, we have today pieces of furniture which are of a unique series. I'm coming back to this. Uh, they're coming from the bedroom. The music room furniture has been lost. And I found a set of uh, furniture which is very similar to what we found described in the inventory of 1817, and which is mahogany furniture which the backrest cut out in the shape of musical instruments. So if one day we find a set like this, it would be wonderful to reintegrate this into the music room. Mm -hmm. Now the bedroom furniture with the swans is one of the very few sets of swan furniture known to the present day. The other set having belonged to the sister-in-law of Eugène de Beauharnais at the Palais Élysée, where they are still in the Salon d'Argent. And uh, we have to imagine that this furniture, which is today gilded with these wonderful swans, was covered not with silk, but with silk velvet embroidered with silk and gold thread. So we are working on that project, and we just need to find the budget to very slowly perhaps do one chair, then another one, and we would be happy, very happy if we could do this. This is a surviving uh, armchair from the Napoleonic period, which is actually in the Salle du Conseil of the Chateau de la Malmaison uh, near Paris, and which is from uh, the Napoleon household. Now, to show you how it look, the rooms looked, I show you also a picture of the Salon series before the restoration. Um, before the restoration and after. So you see somehow uh, what happens and how everything looks different. And all the elements here, the fireplace, Babylonie, the vases, everything is there. We have the same um, furnishings which, which are coming from the house. Many of them as the vases were documented in the building and as you would see in the in the book also, which is too long to speak about in, in this talk, there's a whole part of the building which doesn't exist anymore, which are les petits appartements, the private apartments. And these are rooms, they were transformed in the 19th century first for living quarters for secretaries and cleaning persons, and then later to in, in the 20th century into catering kitchens. So they're very high rooms, very small rooms, and they were all uh, divided into different levels. And they were amazingly richly and refined in their, um, in their furnishings. We tried to evocate this in the book with some uh, pictures which are known from the time of how these rooms look. Now what we have is that we have some objects which are in these rooms. So these vases belong to Eugène de Bournay, probably a souvenir de voyage, a grand tour souvenir from Italy, and they have miraculously survived in the building. Now those chairs were again in very bad condition. Again, the frame had been, car had been uh, uh, chucked over with the, uh, to, in order to accommodate the coils. We had to repair these and uh, the gilding had to be very carefully conserved in order to preserve as much as possible of the original gilding. And then finding finally the original structure with the drop on C, which makes the whole uh, look much easier and much lighter in appearance. For the coloring, we worked very closely with uh, French National Museums. <coughs> Um, who have sometimes 
pieces like this armchair, which is in the storage at Fontainebleau Castle, when you take off the cushion of the bergère, which is completely faded and looks like pink and pale green, you take off the cushion and you see how the original colors were really very strong and contrasting in a way as you uh, hardly ever see when you're the, the normal, doing the normal visitor's tour. And here we knew that the color was cherry red. Cherries had a different red in the 18th century than the cherries we buy today. So we found that document which is described as being cherry red in the archive of the Mobilier National. They very generously allowed the silk weaver to take the sample to make swatches and to try to make the same dye. And then we associated that color with a motif from about 1805 in order to create, recreate that textile um, from the, uh, which would go with the room as it was in the, in the, in the time of Eugène de Boinet. Same thing for the les bordures. We knew that we had one border which was large and we had one border which was very thin. So au Mobilier National they had a border which would correspond to the period and which was then just rewoven in changing the colors according to the principle of the two colors of this broken white and the red of the room. The uh, uh, upholsterer in charge uh, works not with SketchUp but with uh, watercolors and paper and he delivered these wonderful um, presentation drawings which we then have to discuss with the committee and with the, with the ambassador and his wife and we then start, when the project is admitted, we start to work um, really all hand stitched onto this incredible um, cushion and upholstery um, gives you an idea how, how we proceed for the, the upholstery. This picture is very interesting in order to redo the painting which had come back to, uh, had evolved over the time into a kind of uh, monochrome grayish white color all over the place. Uh, we found out that actually it was a much more distinguished and very much more sophisticated coloring which we were able to recreate is, as a repaint in the room but based on the um, conservators' uh, uh, scrapings on the, in, in a hidden corner of the, of the walls. And this is how the room <coughs> looks when you visit the palace today, uh, very atmospheric in this incredible photograph by, by Francis Hammond. Now we are having documents and we were very fortunate that a colleague from Fontainebleau again uh, hinted to us at a document which is actually coming from the office of uh, Sir John Soans in London and he had his architect Gandhi part of his uh, part of his team who went to Paris in 1814 and he documented French houses and amongst those watercolors is a rendering of the bathroom in Hotel Boine. The bathroom is legendary, known, a highlight of every visitor who comes to see the house and we're very very happy to to have these because in those watercolors we see features which are no longer there. And I can tell you we had a discussion over that room and the room has been changed so much that we kind of refrained from doing more conservation than what, I, what we did and what I will show you in a moment. But this apparently was drapery which was uh, out of silk with gilded, gilded fringing. So alone this would have been something very, very important. Um, it is missing in the inventory of 1817. It was just documented in 1814. So I think such as also other elements, it might have been that some of those things might have been souvenir, or better to say looting, of the Prussian occupation in the time when the house didn't belong but was actually occupied by the Prussian army. Now we looked um, and took scrapings with the conservatives here on the elements. We found different colors, but basically the color scheme is there. The mirrors have been preserved, and what was most interesting is that Gandhi describes very elaborately the flower arrangements around the bathtub. So we looked, we found these panels around the bathtub, we were able to lift them, we found the places for containers which would have had plants and planters, so we recreated them. And we took the artistic liberty to, um, as the family of Josephine came from uh, the Caribbean islands, we took some exotic plants to put in there as artistic liberty. And the whole thing works very well and, uh, and, and makes a really stunning effect in, in, the, in, the, in the room, which is really dominated by an amazing inlaid floor, which shows the rape of Europe, um, in a mosaic by Belloni, a Roman a stone worker who was brought to Paris by Napoleon in the early 1800s.
Another incredible room of importance is the Turkish boudoir, which is uh, in the direct to understand in the direct succession of the Turkish rooms which the Comte d'Artois had in the temple, Marie Antoinette also in Versailles, and also in Fontainebleau. And uh, this is the early manifestation of a Turkish boudoir in a private house after the revolution. We know that Eugène de Boisnay visited officially as um, on a police commission um, a harem uh, when he was in Cairo. Um, this room depicts a very um, strange frieze which shows the going of a young lady from her father's house over the market uh, for women to the harem of a pasha. Um, so that was the restroom which is in front of the bathroom. It's a very important testimony and has always for the oriental taste in, in Europe at that time and has a very um, big influence because in the 19th century it was copied by uh, people uh, in Paris. It was taken as a, a source of inspiration and we have in Schloss Linderhof the Moroccan pavilion which was shown in 1867 on the um, Great Exhibition and later acquired from the estate of Strauss in Berlin, who had put it up in Silesia, um, <laughs> for Linderhof by Ludwig II, the Bavarian king. So this is this wonderful room. The textile is obviously not yet the right one. This is a reconstruction from the 1960s using a pattern from the 1870s. We know that this room looked different, so more work to be done. Uh, but what is fantastic is that we have the furniture, which is really so fragile and just done out of boards. Very simple. It's looking more like theatre furniture than anything else. Uh, another very interesting document in the house is this sculpture in plaster, which we still don't know, and if only a few can help us to find if this is an archaeological figure or from antiquity or a neoclassical figure. We don't find, uh, didn't find out what it was. The interesting thing is it's documented in 1817. It's a very simple plaster, and it has survived to the present day, which I find a kind of miracle, you know, because plaster is very ephemeric. Now, what she shows is that she holds a bird in her hand. We interpret this figure as the uh, symbol of adaptation, and of course that would go with the fact that Napoleon really adopted uh, Eugène as his um, adoptive son in 1806, and that would have been really the success of Josephine's aiming to see her uh, natural son from her first bed really as the successor of Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon wanted to have own children, we know the story, due to the fact that she couldn't bear him a son, uh, he divorced and he married Louise, who gave him the son, the King of Rome, who was then later Duke of Reichstadt and died uh, very sadly at a very young age in, in Vienna. But this whole story of the adoption and of the son of the possible successor of Napoleon is inherent in the history of the building. Josephine also very much present in the choice of the ornamentation. We have incredible rich paintings. The decorative paintings are estimated at a very high price in the uh, sales deed which were drawn for the uh, sale of the building from uh, Eugène de Boisnay to the King of Prussia. We lack the two boxes or suitcases of bills of the original building and decoration which were mentioned in an inventory but uh, the simple <coughs> numbers of prices which uh, for these decorations uh, which amount to a third of the sales price are giving us information enough. Uh, we were very lucky to discover also this uh, wonderful little watercolor in the Metropolitan Museum which shows Josephine as a, a lover of plants and of natural life. She was investigating into nature in her plant house, in her greenhouses, in my maison. And this love for the birds and for the plants is really reflected in the decorative schemes adopted for the Salon de, or Salon of the Four Seasons and the music room in the uh, Hotel Boarnay. The 19th century saw a very um, respective uh, dealing with the building um, in the shape of a pupil, a student of Percier, who was Ignaz Zitov, born in 1792 in Cologne, which was then occupied by the French Revolutionary Army. He was a French. Uh, by, by, by that occupation. He went to study in Paris, which was then easy for him, uh, was in the workshop of Percier, and he uh, settled in Paris. He never returned to Cologne. He became German again 
at a later state and he gave all his archives to the city of Cologne where they can be seen. Apart from being in charge of the maintenance of the building for the King of Prussia, he is of course also very well known for urban projects such as La Place de la Concorde and the arrangement of La Place des Toiles and other buildings, very important buildings like the Gare du Nord in Paris. And so he's a very important architect in Paris in the 19th century coming straight from the school of, of Charles Percier. The imperial time uh, saw these very uh, strange feelings between France and Prussia, a constant um, difficult period and a constant kind of competition. We have found uh, amazing documents such as a room which is called the throne room. It was an Egyptian salon in the 19th century. And this picture you see here, which Kaiser Wilhelm put up with the throne in front of it. And as he wasn't there, the throne is turned this way around. This is part of the etiquette. But this picture was um, described in the contemporary press as a declaration of war uh, by Prussia in, in France. And one can just, I mean, this is kind of, it's kind of very bold, uh, and to see it, uh, it's no longer existing in the palace. Um, but the throne does exist. It's now in the collection of the Chateau de Versailles. So we were very happy to find that, and it's made by Fourdinois, an eminent um, ebonist from the later 19th century. The 19th century saw also admirative visitors, and one of them was Louis II, who came to uh, Hotel Beauharnais in 1874, when he was actually coming to Paris and Versailles to measure uh, Versailles. And they take really the measurements with the architect before embarking on the adventure of building Herren Kiemsee, the exact copy of Chateau de Versailles. And he had signed up with um, Bismarck, uh, who paid his debts for his buildings, um, that he would agree to the founding of the German Empire. And in so far, he could stay in the Hotel Boine, which was a kind of um, the kind of residence for people who came uh, visiting from from um, from from abroad or from Germany. Now, in the 19th century, the house was still standing on the uh, quai, which was quai, quai d'Orsay, which is seen here on this watercolor from 1910, uh, very idyllic as it, it was in this post-impressionist painting. Uh, rooms had been changed. Uh, this is a view of the gallery, uh, which was really a part of the apartment of the ambassador. Um, the house was documented, we found most incredible documents on the internet which we didn't expect. So also pictures from the flood or the, the, you know, the janitory who was a lady who was drinking and smoking and she was sent back to Germany because of that. Um, in the 20s the building was a hotspot for social life by normalization of the Franco French-German relationships, and we have this incredible painting which is on the other side of the park in the current Beckmann exhibition, Max Beckmann painting a party at the Hotel Boinet, that's how it is called. Um, and we, uh, uh, my colleague Jörg Ebeling, who worked on the 20th century, was then able to find these incredible photographs from this very fashionable magazine, Die Dame, which was published in Berlin until 1934. And there are actually photographs which just correspond to the kind of mundane life of the time. Much darker periods are also very well documented with the ambassador Arbetz uh, coming out of the palace and Leni Riefenstahl visiting um, Paris in 1940 with uh, the ambassador Arbetz. Now, the uh, palace is uh, very uh, well kept now. We have kind of done a grand tour for conservation. There's still lots to be, uh, to be done. It needs a constant surveillance because it is used as uh, you can imagine every day and seen by thousands of people every every year so we uh, have a now a service of, of going through the building uh, on a very regular basis to check on damages and there is uh, every means of budget which is given to us to help to prevent uh, these kind of, of things happening we also instruct the people who are in the house and to deal with these objects every day in order to raise their awareness about how to keep and how to live with these um, precious objects under the strain of a constant use, of a daily use of, of many, many visitors. And I hope that the publication of the book will also help in order to raise this awareness and that um, we are very happy that it was possible for us to fix um, for once and ever in print 
the state of uh, the knowledge we have at the present day and hopefully this house will continue to live uh, for many many generations. Now the house is one thing, the garden was another. We were able to recreate a landscape kind of a romantic garden with the help of the director of the um, gardens and parks in Berlin and Potsdam who with his students developed a project which was inspired by this 1817 watercolor and which really shows the, big, the, the state of the garden over the different periods, how it was changed and how we kind of came back to this uh, romantic configuration. And the garden is a constant change. Every generation wants to add something, make it more look like <coughs> something. It was very interesting that in the beginning it was apparently two parterres, very straight. The 19th century wants to make it French and they put in a fountain and it becomes something very rectilinear and so it needed some time to come back to this romantic feature which was kind of the period, Eugène de Boinet, with those wonderful interiors which he wanted to, to be based on. So, um, even so, Eugène de Boinet himself, and this is a bust which was on the art market some years ago, has really hardly lived in this house, which was taken away from him in 1806 due to the high expenses he had spent in it and used as a guest house for Napoleon. He recovered it only in 1810 when he kind of tried to come more often to Paris from, from Milan. He uh, intended, apparently, when the downfall of the Napoleonic Empire, Empire came to settle again in Paris, he did some works in the years between 1810 and 1840. After the um, downfall at Waterloo, he knew that he couldn't come back. He settled in Munich, in the hometown of his wife, Augusta Maria, uh, where he died as a pretty young man in the middle of his 40s. Um, and having also built a very nice palace there. So I hope that this idea, um, this presentation, gives you an idea of the artwork which is still there, the artwork which has been lost, and this is actually at the Smithsonian in Washington, uh, a table set which we know was made for Eugène de Boinet. It was sent to Munich and from there made its way over Russia to the United States. So this is a very nice kind of a survival of the smaller objects in the house. And I just hope I've given you an idea about um, Eugène, the house and the remains of it and to encourage many to, of you to read the book and get more ideas. So I finish with these wonderful images of objects we found, um, which can be located as having belonged to Eugène and probably been in the house in the private apartments. And I thank you very much for your amable attention. Merci beaucoup. Michelle Major. Um, I'm the faculty of the BGC and I would, uh, would be moderating this Q&A session. Um, and before I forget, somebody here in the audience, less technologically challenged than I am, has a little tablet in case somebody from BGC TV is asking a question. Yes? No? We don't have it today. Oh, right. <laughs> I think I so successfully got rid of that option. <laughs> um, so I open the floor to questions for all in looking at that group of, of small, uh, you said there were smaller rooms instead of the one large room that's now configured as a dining room. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what would have, did Eugène ever use the house for grand entertaining where he would have needed a bigger room? And if so, where was it? Yeah, the big room is the dining room, which was reconfigured in the 19th century right. and then remade as a dining room. And the Duchesse d'Abrant is describing a party which was organized before he left for Italy. So there was definitely a party, a housewarming party, before uh, he left. And when he had left, it's very funny and very charming, um, that that was like uh, just some months later, Hortense de Beauharnais uh, arranged a party for the wedding because there were many people who couldn't go to Munich from Paris because it was a sh wedding of short notice. And of course they didn't have Eurostar and planes, <laughs> so it was more difficult. And they arranged a party in that gallery where the bust of 
uh, of Eugène was standing in the center of the room, it was surrounded by a crown of laurel. <laughs> That's what we know from the written document. So it was definitely used as a, as a party gallery. Oh, okay. Both Just for the record, that yeah. surtout that you show yeah. is in fact right across the park at Cooper Hewitt. In, we'll in storage there. or is it visible? It's not at the moment visible, but it's coming into an exhibition right, right here. Right. We're looking forward to this. Uh, <laughs> right. Super. Sure, sure. Yeah, cheers. So I'm, I'm curious to know about the financial undertaking of this. So is there a, an annual budget for something like this and then you rely on additional donations from the friends or whomever or how does that work and also what is the mindset of Germany now that they have taken such a project on which is clearly in the French decorative arts tradition what went through their minds when they decided to well, the building is recognized as being historically very important in France, anyway, because it's so rare and unique, and also in the context with uh, the French-German relations. And it's since the beginning that the two countries work on this, like really a project of cooperation, you know, mm -hmm. to make this happen. Um, and the money is given by the federal government for the, from the foreign office, because this is the most precious building which Germany owns today abroad. Mm. And there are sometimes tendency of saying, do we need this, do we sell this, is it really necessary? But for the moment we can still fight the cultural corner of saying like 200 years in, in possession of Germany being used as a mixed meeting point for you know, French um, German encounters, it's, it's been working, you know, and uh, there are ye 